Buddhist Magic by Sam Van Skyke. Despite the importance of magical practices in Buddhism, they are still one of the least studied aspects of the religion. I suspect that one of the main reasons for this is the idealized image of Buddhism as a rational religion, essentially free from superstition and ritual. Though this ideal is belied by any experience of the practices of modern Buddhist communities in Asia, this is often just taken as evidence that Buddhism degenerated from its early ideals. Yet, as early as the evidence can take us back, spells and other magical practices are there. Figures of ogres adorn early Buddhist monasteries, and the Pali Canon includes accounts of Buddhist monks dealing directly with such beings. The canonical texts include spells for protection from non-human beings, and sometimes also for summoning them. And the earliest manuscripts containing Buddhist texts found in Afghanistan also contain magical practices. In general, I think it's best to avoid grand theories of magic. These theories have a tendency to conflate or homogenize what are actually quite diverse and distinct practices. We would do better to look at what makes magic a useful concept in the concept of Buddhist societies, to make sure we're not simply imposing an entirely foreign concept upon the material we're studying. Our understanding of what we want to call magic should come from specific sources, and these are often manuscripts. In my book on Buddhist magic, I focused on a Tibetan book of spells from Dunhuang, which was found among a vast cache of manuscripts sealed in a cave shrine in Gansu province in China at the beginning of the 11th century. The shrine was part of a major Buddhist cave temple complex near the town of Dunhuang. The sealed cave was discovered by a Chinese monk in 1900 and subsequently visited by explorers from several colonial powers who examined the manuscript cache and sent selections from it back to their own countries. One of the largest selections from the cave was gathered by the explorer Orwell Stein and sent to London, where it now resides in the collections of the British Museum and British Library. The manuscripts include scrolls, loose leaf books called poti, and stitch booklets, and they're written in a variety of languages, including Chinese, Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Cotonese. Most of them contain Buddhist texts, though there are also documents with letters, contracts, and administrative material. This is the context in which this early Buddhist book of spells came to light. It is one of several thousand Tibetan manuscripts from the cave, and yet, in some ways, quite different from all the others. This manuscript, which has the shelf mark IOL TIBJ401, is a codex formed of long, thin pages stitched along the middle with thread. I will now look in more detail at four rituals from the manuscript Book of Spells from Dunhuang. This will give us an idea of the range and variety of Buddhist magic. The first ritual in the Book of Spells I want to look at is on divination. And this involves having a child gaze into a reflective surface, such as a mirror, who is then questioned by the ritual master. The text on the screen is a direct translation from the Tibetan. And it shows how the area in which the ritual is to be performed is prepared, and then how the child is directed to gaze into the mirror and then is questioned. The text goes on to give variations on this relatively simple ritual, mainly repeating the ritual using a different surface, such as the ritualist thumbnail coated with lacquer, a skull cup filled with moist barley flour, and a sword. What the child sees in the mirror or any of the other surfaces is said to be anything from any point in the past, present, or future. This method of divination is called prasena, and it became one of the most popular methods in Tibet, though it's also considered the most esoteric. Its uses range from everyday divination to the discovery of the rebirth of the Dalai Lamas. It was also used in the Tibetan medical tradition as a means of medical diagnosis. The text here in the Dunhuang Spellbook contains the earliest surviving instructions on prasena in Tibetan.
Next, let's look at a ritual for exorcism from the same Dunhuang spellbook. Again, the text here is directly from the Tibetan. For one who is under the influence of a ghost or under the influence of a tiger-headed demon, burn the skull of a cat, then mix in clean earth and make the form of the cat. In the presence of an image of the thousand-armed and thousand-faced one, that is, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, take a sword that is made from wrought iron and saying the mantra, chop up the figure of the cat into 108 pieces. By saying the heart mantra, Om Hri Ha Hum Pe Soha, the illness caused by the demon is swiftly cured. Now the basic structure of this cat effigy ritual is continued through to the present day and has been reported by anthropologists working among the Sherpas in Nepal. They have described this ritual as part of larger ceremonies, including funerals and the annual Dumji festival. In these ceremonies, the lay community construct a large effigy described variously as a cat or tiger, made of dough with a finely sculpted clay head and painted with black and white stripes, for which charcoal and flour are used. The young men of the village then chop up the dough effigy into pieces which are taken outside of the village. The ritual of exorcism leads us to another topic also found in the Dunhuang spellbook, aggressive magic. Here we see three short rituals which could be characterized as aggressive magic. The first one is thus, if a malevolent person appears and you want them to be struck by lightning or a meteor, make this mudra, and then it describes how to make a mudra with the hands, and recite the mantra, and then use the mudra to indicate where the lightning or meteor will strike. And another ritual, to break up two lovers, tread both people's family names under the feet of the magician. If they do not separate, say the mantra 200 times and visualize the two of them breaking up. If you do, after a day they will no longer be lovers and will break up. And then the opposite of this, to reconcile two people who are unfriendly, do the same as in the previous ritual. Note exactly as above, that's written in the spell book. Visualizing the two being reconciled, they will want to reconcile their quarrel. The presence of uh, violent and coercive magic in Buddhist scriptures uh, and biographies and spells like this remains an unresolved tension in Buddhism. To understand it for ourselves, I think we must move out of the realm of doctrine and theory and acknowledge that Buddhist monks were often operating in environments where their position was insecure. And while the ideal of monastic seclusion placed them outside of the threats and needs of lay life, their reliance on lay people's sponsorship placed them directly in the sights of people looking for solutions to their problems. A wide variety of spells like this allowed monks to negotiate their needs. Despite the presence of aggressive magic in the spellbook from Dunhuang and others like it, most Buddhist magic is to do with helping and healing. And the spells for pregnancy and childbirth are good examples of this. Again, this is from the spellbook of Dunhuang, directly translated from the Tibetan. If a childless woman wants to have a child, first make a mandala, then sprinkle the ground with flowers and mustard seeds, to limit the circumference with five coloured thread, then to allow a woman to conceive and give birth to a child and to protect its life from being snatched away, do as follows. On the eighth and fourteenth days, a monk holding the eight vows should perform a puja, clean her body and dress her in new clothes, ornament her with jewellery and take her into the centre of the mandala, place mustard seeds on top of her head and stay until midnight reciting aspirational prayers and confession. This ritual for pregnancy in the Tibetan Book of Spells addresses both women who wish to conceive and pregnant women who are concerned about threats to the unborn child. It specifies that a monk is to perform the initial ceremony, which involves taking the woman into the centre of the mandala, where they stay until midnight. At the end, an amulet is created and attached to the woman. The second part of this ritual hands over the agency to the woman herself. In the case of any sudden threat to the pregnancy, understood here as an attack by child-snatching spirits, the woman is to grab a vajra and utter a binding command to the spirit, and then propitiate it with food offerings. She is also to engage in visualisation of children previously lost in pregnancy coming from the heavenly realm of the four great kings. She imagines binding them and making them stay there. After that, she imagines goddesses coming to protect the child in her own womb. The Book of Spells from Dunhuang that we've been looking at is the earliest surviving Tibetan Book of Magic. But in Buddhism, there are earlier sources for our understanding of magic as it was practiced on the ground. 
The ancient kingdom of Gandhara was based in the Peshawar Valley in what is now northwestern Pakistan, growing to include the fertile Swat Valley and the prosperous city of Taxila. There were Buddhists in Gandhara from very early in the history of Buddhism, but it was in the time of the Kushan Empire in the first to third centuries AD that Buddhists received significant financial support and built major monasteries and stupas. Several collections of birch bark scrolls found in Pakistan and Afghanistan have appeared in recent decades, and scholarship on these has shown that most date from the first century BCE through to the third century CE. They are the earliest Buddhist manuscripts as well as the oldest manuscripts from South Asia. When they were first discovered, several media stories called them the Buddhist Dead Sea Scrolls. The text on these scrolls is almost all written in the Gandhari language and in a script called Karoshti, both of which have disappeared from use in the Buddhist world. Over 70 scrolls have been found so far. The first find is now in the British Library, while others have entered various public and private collections. These Gandhari manuscripts provide a different and messier picture when compared with the Pali Canon. All canonical collections present an idealised picture of the tradition as it wants to be seen, while manuscript caches like these tend to have come out of other circumstances. These scrolls are a source for understanding what was going on in specific Buddhist communities and Gandhara at a relatively early stage in the history of Buddhism, though of course still several centuries after the death of the Buddha himself. One of the Gandhari scrolls pictured here contains a magical protection text called the Sutra of Manasa, King of the Dragons. This text dates from the 1st or 2nd century CE and teaches a King of Spells or Vidya Raja, which consists of reciting a mantra. Most of the words of the mantra are a list of powerful poisons. By reciting them, the poisons, and by extension, other threats are neutralised. The sutra assures the reader that whoever recites the spell does not have to fear humans, wild animals, ogres, snakes, and general dangers including fire, water, and poison. The mantra in the Sutra of Manasa is a mixture of words and meaning-free syllables that have roughly magical functions, such as hirichiri, kirichiri. Across the mountain passes that led from Gandhara to the oasis cities of the Taklamakan Desert, such as Dunhuang, remains of once flourishing Buddhist culture survived. The Bauer manuscript is named for Lieutenant Hamilton Bauer, who purchased it from the locals when he was passing through the town of Kucha in 1890. The manuscript was sent to the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal in Calcutta, where it was studied. It was discovered that the Bauer manuscript is actually seven different manuscripts, which together make up 51 loose-leaf folios bound together with string. All of the manuscript parts probably date to the end of the 4th century AD, although some have argued it could be later. The manuscript is written in the Gupta Brahmi script, used in India during the 4th to 6th centuries. The first three parts of the Bauer manuscript are medical treatises. Part 1 begins with a narrative that describes the properties of garlic, followed by a variety of formulas and recipes for potions for lengthening life, eye lotions, remedies for baldness, and recipes for coughs. Part 2 begins by paying homage to the Buddha, but it's otherwise not specifically Buddhist. It contains recipes for powders, linctuses, pills, medicated ghees and oils. In many cases, mantras are recited in preparation of these recipes. This part of the manuscript contains formulas for specific ailments, including fever, inflammation, but also aphrodisiacs and hair dyes. There are also chapters specifically on diseases in children and disorders in pregnant and nursing women. Finally, part three contains further recipes linked to the cures outlined in part two. The next two parts, four and five of the Bauer manuscript, contain divination, using the method of rolling dice. This divination method seems to have been popular among Buddhist monastics of the time, as it appears in other manuscripts and fragments from the area. In both texts, they are not particularly Buddhist, paying homage to Shiva, Vishnu, and other Indian deities and spirits. The various results of the divination show the practice is meant for lay patrons, with many of them involving marriage, business, and other concerns of householders. Part 5 was identified as a partial copy of an Indian manual for dice divination by an obscure figure only identified as Garga. The last two parts of the text contain the popular Buddhist magical text, the Great Peacock Queen Spells. Based on the Book of Spells from Dunhuang and other Buddhist manuscripts, I came to a working definition of what we mean by Buddhist magic which is in three parts. First of all, I use the term magic in a Buddhist context to point to rituals entirely performed for this worldly ends, in which the ultimate aim of Buddhism, enlightenment, is only very directly linked to the practice. When figures of Buddhist 
and bodhisattvas appear in these practices. Their role as saviour or exemplar of enlightenment is not forefronted, and their purpose is only to guarantee the effects of the magic spell. Second, magic in Buddhism is characterised by the swift and clear relationship between the ritual and the result. In these rituals, the result follows swiftly after the accomplishment of the spell. This is a feature that the client would expect, and in many cases, the spells address pressing concerns like illness, the need for urgent answers, or the resolution of a difficult social situation. Thus, the expectation of the recipients is for a swift and obvious movement from cause to effect. Many Buddhist magic texts actually state what the observable result of the ritual will be, and exactly how long the recipient might have to wait for it to occur. The third way I define what we mean by magic here comes from the structure of Buddhist books of spells. These are collections of practices aimed at specific worldly ends, including, but not limited to, healing, divination, summoning and adjuring spirits, cursing, protecting, finding treasure, clairvoyance and clairaudience, and turning oneself invisible. Each spell is usually quite brief and the instructions are clear, even to a non-specialist. I came to see the Tibetan Book of Spells from Dunhuang written in the 10th century and rediscovered in the 20th as a way of understanding the history of Buddhism from the bottom up. Rather than trying to understand Buddhist texts and doctrines through the scriptures and a few key events, manuscripts like this book of spells offer insights into the everyday local events of Buddhist monks and lay people. The elite level of society surely had an effect on these day-to-day -day activities but it did not determine or radically change the concerns of pregnant women, farmers, and traveling merchants. The Buddhist rituals have been calling magic concern childbirth, crop yields, illness, and drought, and they are aimed directly at the concerns of ordinary people. Often administered by monks and nuns, they also provide a key part of the interface between monastics and laity. The exclusion of magical practices and powers from most discussions of Buddhism in the modern era can be seen as part of the adoption of Buddhism by Europeans and Americans, and also as a result of modernization movements in Asia and within Asian Buddhism. Another barrier to understanding how fundamental magic is to mainstream Buddhist practice is academic specialization. Buddhist studies relying heavily on transmitted texts, usually from the canon, has not engaged deeply with manuscripts, except where these help with understanding the transmission of canonical texts. And the observation of the actual practices of Buddhists on the ground has been left largely to anthropologists who rarely engage deeply with the history and texts of Buddhism. So there's been very little study of Buddhist magic users along with their books. This is where the digital collections of the Endangered Archives program can really shine in putting the owners of the collections to the fore and allowing researchers to understand how their texts reflect their practices. The digital collections from the Endangered Archives program that I'm going to look at here are created and catalogued in coordination with their owners. And those owners are often still users of the manuscripts themselves. And so Let's start with the project EAP727. This project was carried out by Valentina Punzi and the Qinghai Province Buddhist Culture Research Center. It involved the digitization of the manuscript collections of ritual specialists from the Nyingma school of Tibetan Buddhism, who were called Nyakpa. These are mostly collections belonging to families who have served the role of providing religious and magical services to local people in the region. On the screen here, you can see one example of one of the collections. As the catalog text says here, all of the digitized texts were kept on bookshelves, wrapped in cotton cloth, and include traditional unbound and handwritten Tibetan texts on paper of different size. These are called pecha. The written texts of the collection primarily include rituals, meditation practices, hagiographies, and invocation texts. And as we can see here, the owner of the original material is Shampakya. Here we can see the title pages from two manuscripts from Shampakya's collection. You can also see on each page the family stamp, which uh, designates the family collection to which they belong. An interesting thing about these two manuscripts is that they straddle the, the gap between the religious and the magical in that the first one, the Chu practice, is a strongly Buddhist practice aimed at enlightenment, while the second, the Tur ritual, 
is what we could call a magical practice aimed at uh, dispelling uh, negative forces and aimed at protection. So the role of the Ngagpa, as we can see from just these two manuscripts, straddles that um, slightly artificial division between the religious and the magical. Looking briefly at two further title pages from this collection, we can see the signs of use and repair of the manuscripts. So the repairs in the first picture are clear, and we can also see the oily marks on either side of the manuscripts showing where they've been moved and picked up um, with thumbs and fingers. Along with the older manuscripts in the collection, we can also see these, which are photocopied pages. These, which were done much more recently, fill certain gaps in the collection, and they show how very much this is a living and developing collection of a ritual specialist. EAP 790 is one of several collections of EAP projects carried out by Shankar Kappa in Nepal to digitize the collections of ritual specialists from Buddhist and Hindu traditions. To take an example here, the Gyanka Vajracharya collection. As the catalogue says, this collection of manuscripts belongs to Mr. Gyanka Vajracharya, who lives in Bhaktapur in the Kathmandu Valley. He's a traditional Newari painter. He's aware of the significance and tangible heritage of the manuscripts. And he has a collection which he has developed himself. It includes Buddhist and Hindu manuscripts, literary texts, and also astrology and Ayurveda. This collection contains Hindu texts related to the rituals of Bhairava, Sita Lakshmi, Taleju, and other local deities. It is, in fact, very difficult to distinguish the uh, Buddhist and Hindu um, affiliations of manuscripts and practices in Nepal. But the Vajracharya families are Buddhist teachers coming from the Vajrayana or Tantric tradition of Buddhism with a lot in common with Tibetan Buddhism. This manuscript from one of the Vajracharya's collections is written in Sanskrit and is bound, as you can see here, and is a collection of rituals. When fully opened, some of the pages of this manuscript contain very brightly and beautifully painted diagrams. These diagrams, known as yantra, offer protection, and they can be written and placed on paper, uh, on cloth, uh, situated in the house, situated anywhere where they will offer protection from negative forces. The diagrams shown here show the negative forces known as nagas, the kind of serpent spirits or dragons of Buddhist mythology. And they're responsible for various diseases, but they can also be called upon to cure diseases, and they can also be cured upon to bring rain in a situation of drought. Another very nice feature of this illustrated manuscript is that it shows the various implements used in the magical practices that are described in the manuscripts. So here we see things including vases, sculptures, the ritual items known as the Vajra and the Purbu, ritual swords, and other materials. Speaking of ritual implements brings me to the final project that I want to look at in this talk. This is EAP 749, which was carried out by Patrick Sutherland in Himachal Pradesh, India, with the archival partner, the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. Patrick Sutherland worked with the ritual practitioners uh, known as Buchan, who were interested in preserving and recording their tradition. Once again, the digital collections that were recorded by the project EAP 749 are catalogued according to the collections of the people who own them. So in this case, EAP 7499, the text, Pecha, scroll paintings, tankers, and other performance-related objects belonging to Meme Tsering Topke. And as it says here, the archive belonging to an active Buchen household lineage in the Pin Valley of Himachal Pradesh. 
all the materials in the archive are currently kept with him in his rooms at Ilingi Temple in Rekong Pyo, Kinal. As with all EAB collections, the catalogue data has been ingested into the British Library's catalogue. And you can see here how that appears on the British Library website and how you can explore, in this sense, the collection of this uh, single Buchan through the catalogue. It's preserved and the provenance is preserved here on the catalogue. So let's look at a few objects from this collection. Here we've got two objects, one of which is the drum known as the Damaru, and the other is the ritual dagger known as the Kila. Both are used in, in Buddhist and magical practices. The drum is known to ward off demons, while the ritual dagger pins down and destroys negative forces. Here we see a talisman. These are often worn by Buchen and many other Himalayan and Tibetan peoples. They'll contain talismanic objects for protection or texts. And here you can see the image of a wrathful protector deity as well. Finally, the two images shown here are very much associated with the Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhist tradition, and particularly the ritual of uh, initiation or empowerment. On the left, the five Buddha crown is worn by a Tibetan Lama when they give an empowerment. This form goes back to a very early period. Examples uh, are found in the Dunhuan caves where the manuscript of the Tibetan Book of Spells was found that I was speaking about at the beginning of this talk. This one is a modern version made of laminated plastic. On the right, you can see the Vajra and Bell or Drilbu. And these are used in rituals held uh, in both hands and the bell rung. In conclusion, I hope this very quick review of a few selections from the vast tradition of Buddhist magic has given an idea of what we might mean when we talk about Buddhist magic. But in particular, looking at the EAP collections, I hope it's also shown that the individuals involved are key to understanding why magic is a part of Buddhism and why the distinction between religious Buddhist practice and Buddhist magic doesn't really make sense when you look at the individuals involved. There's a much richer world there that's still to explore, and I hope the existing and ongoing work of EAP will open up more avenues into Buddhist magic in the future. Thank you.